So welcome to this third online lecture in Strength of Materials. We are now at week nine, dealing with composite beams. So brand new uh, topic for today. First of all, let me say that uh, we hope to be back at DTU for teaching the 20th of April. We don't know yet, uh, but even if we return, we will continue to have the online lectures like this uh, in addition to the normal lectures. So for people who are abroad and not able to return, you will still be able to follow the uh, online lectures uh, on YouTube. So uh, we are now in week nine. Uh, one thing you should note here is that uh, today's topic on composite beams is not in the books, not in uh, the first or nor the second book. So we have a specific set of dedicated notes dealing with composite beams. These can be found on Learn and downloaded. Uh, they will be covering exactly what I'm going through today. So if you need some kind of repetition or you need to get more into depth uh, with the theory, please look at the notes. Well, look at the notes anyway, uh, so you have a good idea what's going on. So what you will be seeing also here on the, uh, well, today, uh, and you can see on the semester schedule is that we have a designated second assignment that is handed out today and will be uploaded on Learn. Uh, and it is due next uh, time we meet or just before the lecture next time, which will be on the 20th of April. So this is the second assignment. But now for the composite beams. So what is the topic today? What is it about? What is the main goal? Well, what we want to do is we want to extend what we can work with we have been sort of limited so far that we can only work with beams which uh, cross-section is composed of a single material. Of course, often in daily life we see composite materials. These can be very simple structures, just simply made by several materials put together, but these can also be more advanced composite like fiber reinforced material, like carbon nanotube fiber reinforced polymers and so forth. So it's important for us to be able to find out how do we actually compute the stiffness uh, of these composite beams, uh, specifically the bending stiffness. We know for a uniform material, we have the bending stiffness that we called EI. So the product between the Young's modulus and the moment of inertia. Uh, so if we have a composite beam with more than one material, more than one Young's modulus, how do we compute the bending stiffness? So we need some kind of systematic approach in order to gain or to get at uh, a, an appropriate weighted average of the Young's moduli that are involved. So how do we compute the corresponding and the appropriate bending stiffness if we have a composite? It will not only be the bending stiffness, that's of course what's uh, been mostly relevant compared to the material of the last few weeks where we have specifically looked a lot on bending, but also the actual stiffness. Which we can correspondingly find as the Young's modulus multiplied by the uh, cross-sectional area. Well, again, for a composite beam, we want to be able to find out how do we compute the corresponding axial stiffness? What kind of formula do we need? How do we weigh the different materials with respect to their Young's moduli in order to, to get at the axial stiffness? So that is the goal of today. Uh, and we will be repeating a bit of the material that we already covered when we were computing the bending stiffness or the, young, uh, the, uh, the moment of inertia. So remember a key property that we needed to have in order to compute the moment of inertia was a knowledge of the centroid of the cross section. So if we had a double symmetric cross section, symmetric both uh, with respect to the y and the x axis, which clearly we do not have in the picture that we see here, it's only symmetric with respect to, uh, no, sorry, y and, and, and z axis, it's only symmetric around the z axis, it's not symmetric around the y axis. So if, it, if we do not possess, or the cross section does not possess this double symmetry, we need to be able to compute the 
location of the centroid of the cross section. And when we were dealing with, uh, um, or when we were computing the moment of inertia, we found the formulas for computing the centroid. Uh, now, if we talk about the uh, the centroid understood as the, um, uh, the the center of gravity, we here have that the um, mass density also comes into play uh, in the formulas. Now, uh, let's let's move on. Um, so, of course, for most beams or all beams that we have been looking at so far, uh, the density is constant, and then we arrive at the well-known formulas for finding the uh, the centroid. So those formulas we already used in um, in in one of the previous lectures. So as a prerequisite uh, for computing the moment of inertia, we could only do that after we knew where the centroid is. And if it's not obvious, then we need to use these formulas to compute the centroid. Now let's look at an example. Uh, so this is still like one material beam but now we clearly do not know in advance where the centroid is located. Uh, around the y-axis is pretty obvious because it's symmetric around the, I'm sorry, around the z-axis it's symmetric. So we know of course that the centroid with respect, uh, so the y-coordinate uh, will be in the middle of the beam. That's pretty obvious. And that's also what we can see up here. But with respect to the z-axis, of course we need to compute our set C. So we need to uh, evaluate the integral that was uh, introduced on the previous slide. So we find the centroid, the uh, centroid set coordinate as the integral over the area of the set coordinate here divided by the integral over the area, so the area itself basically. So what we can see here is by expanding the integral, so we split up the integral in two parts, one covering the first uniform section from here down to here and the second part of the integral over here covering the final uniform section down here. When we compute these formulas we arrive then at the very simple final formula that we, we have down here. So we can see here with the knowledge of the centroids of the individual uniform parts, so set one is the centroid of the top part, we can see here Set two is clearly the centroid of the second part of the structure. So when we put these two structures together or these two parts of the structure together, we can simply find the compound or the collected centroid as a weighted average. So we multiply the centroid here by the corresponding area. So that's the area of the top part, this one. And we add to that the location of the centroid of the second part, the set two multiplied by the area of the second part, A2, which is here. So if we look at the figure, we have A1 up here and A2 down here. And then we divide it by the total area. So we have a very simple way of computing uh, the centroid uh, in case of piecewise um, uniform sections. Of course, if it's another form, if it's not that simple, we need to do the integration. But we have also tried that in previous lectures. lectures. Uh, now, see, if we then have a non-uniform beam, we don't have the same material. Uh, and then if we, in this slide, uh, concentrate on finding the uh, center of gravity or the mass center, uh, as we saw on the previous slide, uh, this one, while well, the basic formula is actually uh, found by including uh, the density in the formulas like this. So let's see how we do that. We have the same structures or the same um, cross section as before, but now the top part has mass density rho one and the bottom part has mass density rho two. Now performing the integration, we see that uh, in principle, it's very much the same as before. We end up getting the position of the mass centroid uh, by taking the weighted average, we know the position of the centroid of each of the two parts of the structure. And then we multiply by the area times the mass density, area times mass density of the second part, and the total sum of the area multiplied by the mass density. 
Now this was for the mass center or center of gravity, but what is that relevant today is not uh, specifically uh, the mass density or the uh, or the mass uh, center or the center of gravity, but rather uh, what we will call the elastic centroid. So the elastic centroid uh, we find in the very same way as the mass centroid or the mass center, but just by performing the a weighted average with respect to the different Young's moduli of the two cross sections, two parts of the cross section. So now we see here uh, in the figure that the top part, not only does it have the mass density rho one, it also has the Young's modulus E1. And the second part has the mass or the Young's modulus E2. Right, so now when we compute the position of the elastic centroid, we perform the integration uh, with respect to the Young's modulus of the different parts. So we see here we have E1 uh, in the first part of the integration, E2 in the second part of the integration, and then when we also do uh, compute the denominator, we also include E1 and E2 here. So finally we end up with the position of the elastic centroid in very much the same way as on the two previous slides. The only thing we have to remember is that when we perform the computations for each section, then we need to include, uh, we need to multiply it by the corresponding Young's modulus for that part of our structure. So in principle, very simple uh, exercise. And in a moment, we will do a simple example where we actually show how to compute the centroid of a, of a cross section that's similar to the one that we have here. Now, this was uh, this is a real composite, right? Here we have a cross section that corresponds uh, or that con consists of two different materials, specifically what's important for us, two different Young's moduli, E1 and E2. Uh, we could also think of more uh, complex composites. Uh, if we talk about fiber reinforced composites, then we might have something that looks like this. So we have a matrix material which is the gray, and then we have some reinforcing fibers that uh, are um, colored in dark gray here. Uh, so the basic idea of a fiber reinforced composite is that we have some relatively flexible gray, uh, light gray material, and then we have some stiff fibers that somehow stiffen the structure to give it a, a higher, uh, give it a higher stiffness. So how do we treat it uh, here? Well, uh, we can find the mass center, oh, sorry, the uh, elastic centroid in the same way as we did before. The computations are a little bit uh, more tricky, you can say. Uh, so let's first note that we can actually look at the, the composite as a sum of two parts. So we can either see it as the sum of the matrix material that has Young's modulus Ea plus the fibers with the Young's modulus EB. And that's of course uh, okay, uh, but if you then do the computations that we did introduced in the previous slides in order to find the uh, elastic centroid position, the computations are a little bit cumbersome. So much simpler actually to uh, think, of, think of it as uh, in a slightly different way. Uh, so we can also think of the compound uh, composite as the sum of a uniform material uh, of Young's modulus Ea, and then add uh, some parts to it, which has Young's modulus corresponding to the difference between uh, the Young's modulus of the reinforcement, the B, and the Ea, the Young's modulus of the matrix material. These are actually just two different ways of looking at, at the same thing. The second uh, approach, slightly more abstract, but still valid. And the good thing and the benefit of doing it the second way is that we can directly write up uh, the position of the centroid using the technique that we introduced in the previous slide. So we take the, we go back and look at the general formula. We take the um, position of the centroid uh, of the different parts. So here we, for the first part here, we directly know, of course, since it's a homogeneous material, we directly know where the centroid is. It's in the middle. And we know 
the Young's modulus and we know uh, the area uh, of the corresponding uh, section here. And then for each individual fiber, we can uh, then add to it the um, the corresponding uh, contribution that we have from the all the second parts in the integral here. So we have here the difference in the Young's modulus that we need to specify, and then we have the position of each uh, circular cylinder that we have reinforced it with, and then the corresponding area of each cylinder. And then down here, we just need finally to divide by the sum of the Young's modulus and the area of the respective parts. So that's just to show that even if we have a more comp uh, complex composite, we can still use this approach to find the centroid, the elastic centroid. And remember, the elastic centroid has nothing directly to do with the stiffness, of course, but it's a prerequisite in order to compute the stiffness that we're actually interested in uh, later on. So just before we continue, another thing you should be aware of is that when we have now, you can see in the top figure here, we define our cross section in a coordinate system that we have, as it looks, have somehow put arbitrarily somewhere. And that's the main point here that we're actually also going to show when we do our example, that when we compute the properties, uh, we need to start somewhere. We don't know in advance where our centroid is. So when we compute the centroid, we just take our uh, starting point in some arbitrarily located uh, coordinate system. And then based on that coordinate system, we actually find out where our centroid is located. So to get started, we just put our coordinate system in an arbitrary position. Now let's look a little bit on why it is necessary to know the position of the elastic centroid. Now if we consider a beam uh, with a cross section as indicated in the figure, uh, and we subject this beam to uniform axial tension. Well, if we have axial tension, we know that the we have a, a, a normal force, but we have no moment, right? We only supply a moment or an actual tension to our system. So we expect to get out a normal force and no, no, no moment. So if we see, if we base our computation of a coordinate system that's located directly in the center, if we assume that our centroid is here, when we then look, well, the strains we know, it's a uniform actual tension. So we know that our strains are uniform. We know that our stresses are uniform. However, we've, if we multiply our stresses onto our cross section, uh, in order to compute the moment, we know that based on this coordinate system, we do actually compute a non-zero moment. And that's, of course, completely nonsense, right? We have uniform actual tension. Uh, we have no bending, so we have no moment. But if we use our centroid in the middle, uh, which is obviously wrong, but if we had done that, if we had not known better, then we would have been able to get a non-zero moment. On the other hand, if we put our centroid uh, in the position where we could imagine we have computed it, uh, of course, we could not know in advance that it would be directly there, but we needed to compute that. Uh, if we had done that, we can see that uh, doing the moment computation uh, based on the corresponding stress situation will indeed result in a zero moment. So we can, in other words, conclude that the resultant moment is only zero when it is res evaluated with respect to the correct centroid. So therefore, it's of course uh, essential to know where the centroid is. Now, if we have a more relevant case where we actually have a composite, so a cross section with two different uh, materials with two different Young's moduli E1 and E2, uh, we can see here the same uh, case is actually, it's completely analogous as to the case before. If we do not know where the centroid is and erroneously think it's in the middle, then we would get, even for only actual tension, we would get a non-zero moment uh, as a result. Only if our base point or our uh, centroid is located in the right position, do we actually get uh, a zero moment. Another thing that we can see that is uh, uh, rather essential here for the for the common calculations is that when we compute the normal force, we know there is a normal force because we have actual tension. It's of course given as the integral over the stresses. Uh, 
and we know we have a uniform uh, stress strain, we have we can put out the strain and insert instead of the stress E times epsilon, uh, where we have put epsilon outside here. So inside the integral, we have the integral of E dA, which we can then simplify again uh, for the specific cross section and the material properties. But we can see here that in general, when we compute the normal force, we get an integral uh, that is uh, the integral of the Young's modulus integrated over the area. And this integral H1 is actually uh, one of the important things that we are after in this course. So it is the actual rigidity of the beam um, if we have a composite. So it's the equivalent of Ea if we have a composite Oh, sorry if you have a homogeneous beam. We can also see that H1, if E is constant, then we actually uh, reduce to this Ea formula, right? So you can think of H1 as the more general version of the actual rigidity or the Ea uh, constant. Uh, yeah, and then this somehow motivates the fact that these two are equivalent for a homogeneous, uh, well, for a homogeneous beam, then uh, in order to somehow uh, make use of this, uh, you can say equivalence, then sometimes if you have a composite beam, you would define an effective Young's modulus, which you could compute by finding the H1, dividing by the area, and then you have this sort of the effective Young's modulus. And then we can write the ex actual rigidity of the composite beam or the non-homogeneous beam as A times E effective. Uh, now if we look a little further, it's the same picture as before, but if we then compute the moment, so we know that with the right choice, if we evaluate with respect to the centroid, which we had found exactly at this point, at right, this point. Then if we evaluate and compute the moment, it's actually zero, and we can try to do the computation. Uh, so inserting the numbers, uh, we know that the moment should be zero, and y should be zero. And in this computation, we can see that we get this integral. And that's actually what we will define in the forthcoming slides and in the theory, also in the notes, as the H2 integral here. And uh, the basic definition is that the H2 integral is the one that has to be zero if this coordinate system is located at the elastic centroid. So that's somehow the uh, condition for having found the centroid is that this H2 integral is zero, leading to a zero moment. Now, <clears throat> this was for a uh, actual tension. Now, if we go to pure bending, uh, then we also know what should happen. We know that if we have pure bending, then, well, we need a zero normal force. Uh, that's the def one of the definitions of pure bending, but of course we need a non-zero bending uh, moment. So, uh, yeah. So that's of course what we get in the first case, because here we have homogeneous beam uh, with a square, or sorry, a, a rectangular cross section. So if we put the centroid, we know it's in the middle and we do the integration, then we know we get the no zero normal force and we get a non-zero moment. Now again, uh, in a very analogous way, as was the case for the actual tension, we can see here if we erroneously, in the second case, put the centroid in the middle, or if we evaluate all quantities with respect to a coordinate system positioned in the middle, then we do not get a non-zero normal force. So our normal force, oops, our normal force will be different from zero. And only when evaluating with respect to the correct centroid, we get that the condition n equal to zero is true. Yes. Yes, yeah, so this is also expressed in this slide that the resultant normal force uh, with the integral that we have here that we can actually see corresponds to the H2 integral is only zero if the reference axis is coinciding with the centroid. Uh, 
And now we can then go further and actually look at the moment. So the resulting moment that we know is uh, non-zero. We find that here uh, using uh, the formulas and we get this characteristic uh, integral involving the set squared. Uh, and this will depend on where we have chosen the axis. So this will be important. Okay, so let's go through the motion again, but this time with a real composite beam, not just one with a non sort of uh, non regular cross section. Uh, but the same situation is actually true here. So we can see here now, of course, the stress, the strain, and the stresses are a little bit different. So if we just take a moment to look at the strain case and the stresses, so we see here, of course, with pure bending, we get the strain exactly as we expect. Uh, linear variation of the strain over the cross section. But when we look at the stresses, we know that the stress, of course, is equal to Young's modulus multiplied by the strain. So that when we have different strain, uh, Young's moduli in the two different parts of the cross section, the result is that we get this jump in the stresses here. We still have linear stresses uh, varying, but we have a jump in the case where the uh, material properties change. Now, again, we see the argument that uh, we need to have the position of the centroid do the computation with respect to that coordinate system. Otherwise, we do not get the zero normal force here. And again, uh, the condition for the uh, normal force to be zero is that this H2 uh, should be zero. Now, uh, it might seem confusing with all these H1s, H2s, all, uh, so forth, and we will also get an H3, but we will do an example just in a few minutes in order to demonstrate how we actually use these quantities. Because now, uh, of course, we also want to compute the moment. Uh, so the moment is non-zero, and we want to compute it. And uh, now we can see when we set up the, the formulas for the moment, we get this very important integral that we will call H3. And H3 is actually the equivalent for a composite as the EI for uh, a homogeneous beam. So it is the equivalent bending stiffness that we need. Uh, a small side note here is that if we compute H3 uh, for a composite, then we can actually directly use that, for instance, in the elementary cases, because there we, we need EI, but for a composite, it's just H3. Otherwise, we can use the formulas exactly as they are, just with H3 substituting EI. So summing up all the important stuff, uh, it's actually, although it may have looked a little bit complicated, it's very easy. Uh, we only have a, a few numbers of integrals that needs to be evaluated. Uh, so let's see. We have the three H1, H2, H3. Uh, but as we also discussed the first a very important part of doing uh, the exercises usually is to find the centroid, right? So we will start here. How do we find the elastic centroid? And what we see here is to find the elastic centroid, we need to compute the two quantities, H1 and H2. So starting out with an arbitrary cross-section, arbitrary material distribution, we start out by computing H1, computing H2, and using that to compute our position of the centroid, if it's not obvious. We could be so lucky as if uh, we could actually have cases where it's completely obvious where the centroid is. Most cases it's not. And in any case, uh, we, we are going to need H1 and H2 in the further analysis, so it's not a waste of time. Okay, so now we have the position of the centroid, and we will then be able to compute H1 star, which we will define as the beam actual rigidity. And the star corresponds to the fact that it is being computed with respect to the, the real centroid. Up here, we are just computing the quantities with respect to an arbitrary coordinate system. So that's important to remember. We choose an arbitrary coordinate system, compute H1, H2, compute the centroid, and then we can compute the real quantities. So H1 star, which we can see actually coincident, coinc, uh, by coincidence, well, it's not coincidence, but we can see here, it's actually equal to H1. So H1 is invariant with respect to a change in coordinate system. So we already have H1 star, right? The only thing then we need to compute, because we know H2 star is zero, 
we could use it as a check to see if we have computed the correct uh, centroid. But still, what we're interested in is H3 star, because that is going to be our bending stiffness for the beam. And that's going to be of main interest. So in principle three integrals, we need to compute H1 up here, H2 here, and H3 star here. Those are the three integrals which are necessary for a cross section. So the previous calculations are exact and valid for general case of composite cross sections. We can make some very handy simplification in certain cases. So if we have this kind of uh, reinforcement, where we have the reinforcements parallel to the axis, uh, if these, you could think of this, this could be, for instance, small, very stiff fibers in a flexible material. So if the fibers are very small and they are dispersed or they are uh, sort of uniformly distributed in the matrix material, then we can make a much simpler uh, calculation of the effective Young's modulus uh, that we, we would need in order to compute both the actual rigidity and the bending stiffness. So we will actually just compute the effective Young's modulus as a weighted average with respect to the volume fraction uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the different um, uh, materials. Yeah, so these definitions have somehow escaped the slide, but the CF is the volume fraction of fibers, right? So it's basically just computing, uh, if we have a 2D cross section like this, uh, which uh, percentage of the areas is covered by the fibers. And then we can get the, well, of course the CM is the volume fraction of the matrix material, which will of course then be one minus CF, meaning that we can compute the effect of Young's modulus just by using the volume fraction of the fibers and then using this formula with the corresponding Young's modulus of the fibers and the Young's modulus of the matrix material, which of course is a lot easier than doing what we did in the previous, uh, previous uh, slides. But not as accurate, but good enough if it's very small fibers and they are uniformly distributed. Now we will come to the example here. Okay, so basically here we have a composite cross section consisting of two different materials. So the top part has Young's modulus E1, the bottom part has Young's modulus E2. Otherwise the two parts of the cross section have the same size, so they are both uh, H divided by 2 in height and with a width B. So the purpose of the exercise of the example is first to, well, it uses sort of the general approach that we would use in, in most cases when we deal with composites. So first we want to determine the elastic centroid coordinate. Then we want to determine the three integrals, H1 star, H2 star, and H3 star. And then as a final thing, we just want to draw the stress distribution under pure bending. So let's have a look at it. So remember, as I said, when we start by determining the elastic centroid, uh, we do the computations with respect to a completely arbitrary coordinate system. So we choose any, arbit any co uh, coordinate system that we f think is a good idea to choose. And we can see here it's already, there's already a suggestion there's already the suggestion here in the in the drawing that we choose the coordinate system with an R go here, y axis uh, this way, and z axis um, in the vertical direction. We could have chosen another uh, orientation or another uh, definition of the coordinate system, but let's use this one. So here we have our example with B, and then we have our coordinate system, whoops, Y, and we have set it down like this. Okay, so let's go back and think, what was the first thing uh, that we needed to do in order to find the elastic centroid? Well, we needed to compute two integrals. We needed to compute H1, and we needed to compute H2. All right, so let's take it first, H1. So 
So H1 is the integral over the complete area of Young's modulus integrated over the area. So of course, if we would have a different shape, uh, if it's not hadn't been that regular as it is here, uh, then we would have in general needed to do this integration. However, of course, here we can simply split up the integration in two, and then we know that the Young's modulus is constant uh, for each of the two sections, right? So what we get out with a constant Young's modulus, when we integrate over the area, is that we get just Young's modulus multiplied by the area, right? So we get A1, and A1 is the area of the top square here. And then we get the contributions from the second one. And of course, A2 is here. All right. So the, as I said, the geometry is rather simple in this case. So we get E1. And what is the area? Well, we have height, H divided by 2. We have width, B. So this is simply the area. And we have the same area of the second square. Like this. So this is, of course, a general formula for, for arbitrary E1 and E2. Now we know that in this case, E2 equals 4 times E1. So this, in this specific case, what we get is 5 divided by 2, H, B, E1. So this is our H1. Now in order to compute the centroid, we also needed H2. So we just go back, if we cannot uh, remember it, and see that H2 is equal to the integral over the area of set multiplied by E over the area. Like this. So, of course, here the integral uh, becomes a little bit more composite to do. Still, it's very easy because we have a very regular geometry. Now, when we do the integration, we can see that our dA with a constant width becomes B times d set, right? So this need we need to use when we do the integration. Uh, so inserting, and of course our width B is constant throughout the integration, so we can put that outside the integration here. So we get B, and then integrating over the area or all coordinates from zero to H. Now we're integrating over set, and we get set E D set. Uh, but this we can of course also split up in two because our Young's modulus is constant within the two sections. So we split this up in two. We get B. And then the first integral of course goes from zero up to H divided by two. And in this part of the integration, our Young's modulus has the specific value of E1. And then we add the second part which goes from H2 up to H. Here we also need B in front. And in this part, we have E2 as the Young's modulus. Now we can go on here. Oops. So we get B, E1, 
that's from the first integral and then when we do the integral well we get one half h divided by 2 squared And then we get the contribution from the second part. We get b e2. And again, we are integrating sets, so we get 1 half set squared. Here we have contribution both from the top and the bottom uh, limits. So we get 1 half h squared minus 1 half h divided by 2 squared, like this. Now, doing the integration, uh, sorry, the calculations, we end up with a formula that becomes b h squared divided by 8 e1 plus 3 e2, like this. And then for the specific value of e2, we get 13 divided by 8 b h squared E1. Now these are the two quantities that we always need to compute. So the H1, the H2, because we know then that the elastic centroid So doing that Dividing H2 by H1, we find that the centroid is located at the point where we have 13 multiplied by H divided by 20. So somewhere in the a little bit lower than halfway down uh, the set axis uh, uh, ranging from 0 to H. Well, it shouldn't surprise us that the that the weight of the second part is a little bit uh, higher because we have a higher stiffness in the lower part. So we do expect that the elastic centroid is below the half point, right? We could not guess 13 divided by 20. In no way we could do that in advance, but we could somehow estimate that we would be further down than halfway. If we are not that, we should recheck our calculations to see if we actually did things in the right way. So. Drawing in the centroid is, of course, the reason we haven't been talking at all about um, we haven't been talking about, about the y coordinate. We know that the centroid is in the y equal to zero, but we know. Oops, now this is. So we're back here. So we know that the centroid is approximately there. So looking back at our exercise, we can actually already see that we have um, completed a large part of our questions. We have determined the elastic centroid position, coordinate the set C, but we have actually also already found H1 star and H2 star. Why? Well, our set C we have here, but we know that the H1 is invariant to a coordinate transformation so we also know that our h1 star equals to h1. This is always the case. We do not need to uh, relate that to any centroids. This is simply just uh, a number that's invariant to a coordinate transformation. And what we also know, of course, is that our h2 star equals to zero per definition if we did our computations in the correct way. Of course, we could do the check, but if we trust our computations, then a, our h2 star is equal to uh, zero. So all we need to know now, all we need to do now is find our h3 star. And we go back, find the formula for h3 star, it's the bottom formula here, so we can do the computations but of course, we can only do that if we know our H, our set uh, C, and we have found that by now. So the definition, we will call it the bending stiffness. 
not to forget. I mean, using the somehow the notation H three star sometimes makes you forget what it is actually about. But the bending stiffness is is the def it is the definition of the bending stiffness for a composite beam. So our H three star is given as the integral over the area of our set minus our set C. You can already put it in here. This is set C. Uh, we need to square this parenthesis, and then we have E dA. Now this, of course, becomes a rather comp... Uh, let me just erase that again. It looks funny. Like this. Okay, and then this is 13. This is squared. Okay, so this becomes a rather nasty integration when you do it by hand. Of course, you can very easily in just a few clicks do it in Maple or any other mathematical software. Let us just outline a little bit how to do it in hand so that we get everything done here. So again, we split up, uh, replace our dA by BDC of dz. And we have here B. And then we again, we do the integration first from 0 to h divided by 2. And we have set minus 13, 20, ish, like this. This is the part where we have E1. And we have the second part going from where we have E2. Okay, small mis correction here. Of course, it's not minus H divided by 2. It's just H divided by 2 here. Like this. Now, the next simplification we can, of course, make is to move the E1 and E2 outside the integration. They're constants, and we arrive at this. And then the final step is simply just doing the integrations, and we're not going to do that by hand here. It's a rather lengthy uh, calculation by hand, but we end up with And then in a parenthesis, we have 217 E1 plus 37 E2. And with the specific value of E2, we get 73 divided by 480 E1 B H to the power of 3. Now going back to the exercise, we were also asked in the final part, to draw the stress distribution under pure bending. So, if we want to draw a stress distribution, well, we first draw here our cross section and the location of the specific uh, of the centroid that we have found, a little below halfway, 13 divided by 20 h. And then we first uh, draw the uh, strain distribution under pure bending. So we know we have zero strain right at the centroid, and then we have a linear distribution of the strain. So that is how we will get it when we have pure bending. Uh, now, how does that convert into our stress? Well, we know that our stress is equal to Young's modulus multiplied by our strain. Uh, that means that, of course, we will also get a linear variation in the stress, but we remember that we will get a discontinuity at the point where the material uh, properties change. So it's going to be a little hard to do a good drawing here, but let me try it. So down here in the bottom part, where we have a large stiffness, and we draw this with a large slope. So here we cross uh, the centroid, and then we are up at the point where we have our um, change in material properties. So now I just draw the zero point here. So here we have the stresses. 
So negative stresses down here and then positive stress here. And then here we have the change in the stress uh, situation. So we get like this. So we see here that the slope of the second part is significantly smaller, well, four times smaller, because we have four times lower Young's modulus. Uh, and that means that we get this con discontinuity uh, right here due to the change in material properties. Okay. Yeah, so this is basically it. Uh, this is what you have to do today also for a, another cross section. So today's uh, exercises will be about, uh, well, the first one, X12, will be about computing the exact same properties for a cross section uh, that looks like this one here. So you can already see here that things are not exactly as simple because you do have to do some integration here. You don't have these rectangular cross section parts. You do have something where you have to do an integration. The second part is repeating on the second exercise is actually a repetition of uh, the last week's material. Um, so uh, as I have also written out in the announcements, we will stop with the weekly hand ins. Instead, we will have uh, in a little while uh, the online uh, TA session. Uh, but we also have an, an assignment two, uh, which is corresponds to the assignment one that we had a few weeks ago. And this is going to uh, be due after our Eastern break. So Monday, April 20th at one o'clock, just before the lecture, it is to be handed in on, uh, on Learn, not on file sharing. Okay. And this is uh, what it looks like. So it is nothing to do with composites. So we will not uh, repeat the composite stuff in this exercise. So this is mainly dealing with the material in the last uh, three or four weeks. So this will be it for me this time. So I hope to see many of you uh, in the questioning session in a little while. Bye.